Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation. Uh, we were presenting this at the Open Mainframe Summit and ran into uh, microphone issues, so we decided as a panel to uh, present this uh, in its entirety and record it via a WebEx recording so you can uh, replay it properly. Our session here is how to monitor and manage the mainframe and storage systems with open source tools. It was again to be given uh, at the Open Mainframe Summit in September, but we're recording it here today, here on November 11th, 2022. Uh, and with me today, um, uh, let's see if I can advance these slides. Yeah, here we go. Uh, with me today is um, the Vicom team and Converge team. Uh, myself, Len Santolucia, I'm the CTO at Vicom Infinity, a Converge company. We have Ginzel Sanchez, who is part of the Converge company. She just waved, everybody can see her. Uh, Vinny Tyrone, senior architect at, at the company. Uh, Salisu is from all the way from Lagos, Africa. Hello, Salisu. So glad to see you again. He was part of the projects, as you'll see here, that were developed um, when he was uh, doing internship. And John uh, Wolfgang is uh, from our team, is a senior consulting specialist on storage systems for us here at Viacom Infinity. And uh, what our agenda looks like is what you can see here in front of you. Um, we will be talking about something called Zebra uh, uh, and use cases of it in something called VPAT uh, with Grafana and Viva and how it's used in storage. And then we'll conclude for the day. Uh, so, uh, with that said, uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Vinny, who will be covering the next few slides. So, Vinny, may I turn it over to you, please? Thank you, Len. Hi, my name is Vinny Tyrone, and I'm with uh, Vicom Infinity. Uh, I've been with the company for over 25 years doing modernization and new technologies on System Z. And one of the new technologies that came around in 2000 was Linux on Z. And what's on the screen are the products that are supported on Linux on Z, and it's always changing. But uh, on the first column is the most important, and those are the distributions that are supported. And uh, SUSE was one of the first, uh, and then came Red Hat um, and Ubuntu. Those are the three uh, pretty much paid um, distros that you will find on Linux on Z. Um, there are other distributions like OpenSUSE and De Debian and CentOS, um, which is actually owned by Red Hat. And as you know, Red Hat, it was bought out by IBM and it's, and Red Hat is the, um, is the most popular distribution, um, pretty much in the paid community or business community. Um, Ubuntu is probably the most popular in, uh, in the world uh, for non-paid. Um, and then the next column talks about virtualization. So virtualization uh, will be what you will do when you run Linux on Z. And there are really two virtualization engines um, uh, and a third. Uh, so the first is uh, ZBM, which is over 50 years old um, and has been a, a virtualizer um, for Linux and ZOS and itself uh, for 50 years. Um, so it's been around a long time. Um, new on the street is sort of KVM, which will virtualize um, uh, Linux machines also, and all the distros do come with KVM. Uh, so you install it in an uh, LPAR, and then you would virtualize those machines inside of that particular uh, machine running on the metal. 
Um, what's also a virtual virtualizer also is Docker. Um, of course, uh, it doesn't virtualize, it virtualizes, uh, you know, a small container um, instead of it's, uh, virtualizing a full machine, but Docker is, uh, or container technology itself has been uh, very prevalent um, over the last uh, like five to 10 years and foresee it uh, doing much more. Um, and Red Hat does sell uh, or does uh, market uh, OpenShift, uh, which is their container technology. And then, of course, uh, the next columns are languages, and pretty much every language, um, programming language in the world will run on uh, Linux on Z. And, you know, really, Linux on Z is Linux, and Linux is Linux. So, you know, anything that's available on pretty much any platform that is open source. Uh, will run on our platform, Linux on Z. Um, you know, it's commercial software where it's closed source where you might run into issues. So runtimes and, you know, management software and databases, they all run. Um, you know, some of the big databases or open source databases like uh, MongoDB and Post Postgres um, and Maria, um, those databases uh, all are supported and compiled already for Z. Um, and then, uh, of course, Oracle uh, will run uh, virtualized and on, under K, uh, ZVM. In fact, it's the only virtualized, uh, you can only place you can run Oracle virtualized uh, and supported. I mean, you can run it where you want, but supported Oracle is only supported under ZVM um, on Linux on Z. Okay, and then there's Spark Analyze. And remember anything that is um, that is open source, you could just compile it yourself on Linux on Z if it's not compiled already, but pretty much uh, almost every package um, in the last five years um, is compiled for Linux on Z. Next slide, please. One point I'd like to add, Vinny, if I may, is um, the open mainframe project itself is that uh, Viacom and Finney Converge have been uh, members of the open mainframe project since its inception almost eight years ago. And uh, we also have uh, board membership and uh, hold the chair position of the governing board. Just, just so everybody might like to know that in case uh, would like to talk to us about other things. Vinny, yep. next slide. And, and, uh, and just one other point to add, uh, we actually host um, their projects on our Z machine um, uh, that, and it was announced at the Open Mainframe Summit that they are uh, acquiring their own mainframe. Um, and will come online in hopefully 2023. Um, but today we actually host uh, uh, all the infrastructure needed for the Open Mainframe project for all their projects. Okay, so a little, and, little, yep. So and Vinny, uh, don't forget, yep. don't forget, Vinny, you're the guy that runs the forum. I right? am the guy that builds it all. That's correct. Okay, and a little thing about you know uh, converge. Um, by company and Converge company and what we do. So again, like I said in the beginning, I've been with them pretty much from the inception, uh, doing services for this. And again, we have always been on the bleeding edge of um, modernization. So modernization is definitely something um, and new technologies that come to the mainframe. We are, we are the first to promote it and prototype it. But um, some other things that we do is, you know, we architect and design systems for um, all pillars of the industry. Um, we are uh, in all um, industry sectors. Uh, we do capacity planning and modeling. In fact, we will talk about it later, but we actually uh, created a tool called VPAT, which helps in capacity planning. Um, we do disaster um, recovery planning, um, installations of um, new Z machines or, um, or existing Z machines um, and hardware. 
and storage and all the everything else wrapped up in Z, like networking. We do software migration and we also do, um, we work on porting um, applications over to Linux on Z. Uh, we are one of the, we have done quite a few projects working with IBM and with customers to port um, applications written various languages over to Linux on Z um, and over to Z in general, because of course Z has a Unix subsystem there also. Um, encryption, we have worked with a lot of clients and done actually classes on encryption and um, we, uh, you know, we, we do maintenance also, so we'll, we can go in and, uh, and help with augment with your staff to do um, traditional Z, uh, ZOS um, system programming. Um, we can do, uh, of course, system tuning. Again, we have a tool for helping us with tuning, training, and there we go, staff augmentation, which I talked about. And last is modernization, which I've already talked about. So we have a full range of services that our company does provide. Next slide. Okay, and some of the uh, the areas or the, the highlight areas that we work on, uh, we actually created uh, our own secure voice assistant called Viva or Viacom Infinity Voice Assistant, um, not Microsoft Viva, um, and we uh, uh, it is a secure one, so everything runs on your infrastructure. Um, we had. Uh, just ported it out to um, Android, and it can run on an Android board or an Android phone. Um, we also have worked with uh, DevOps, um, specifically with um, uh, Open OpenStack, and also with OpenShift um, to help um, help modernize your workflow. Uh, for your traditional COBOL programs or Java programs or containers. Uh, we've also worked with um, new HyperProtect services. So in running uh, Linux or containers in an encrypted runtime environment. Uh, we also have, uh, we also have um, services for that and modernization and transformation. So already talked about a lot with modernization, but transformation is uh, taking mainframe languages and converting them to Java um, using a tool that um, does the majority of the work um, and it's pretty efficient. And then it's uh, the tool will, and then there's a staff behind that uh, tweak, tweak the Java code to make it more efficient. I think that's it on my sideline. All right, Benny, thank you. And now, folks, we'd like to have some words from Ginzel Sanchez from our team. I must say that Ginzel is a very important part of our team. Uh, she helps us quite significantly at a lot of the summits and conferences, uh, getting things done that guys like us forget. That's why it's kind of a guy thing. <laughs> and um, she's also been with uh, Converge for quite some time. Uh, we've only been with Converge just a little over a year, October uh, 21. But uh, how many years now has it been for you, uh, Ginzel? 2018 it became official, but I believe the process was starting before then. Oh, very good. So. Jenzel, maybe you'd like to give a little background of the company and what what, yes. what Converge is about and so on, especially because of your experience being so vast with it. Go right ahead, please. Hi guys, my name is Jenzel Sanchez. I work with Converge. We were, I originally worked with Essex Tech, which was a company that was acquired by Converge, similar to Viacom. And uh, I joined in 2018, the company. I've been with Essex Tech since 2000. So I, I been in the IT industry for a bit. Um, Converge Technology Solutions is a parent company to a consistently growing family of elite technology companies. 
We have locations in the US, Canada, Europe, and we continue to expand. Right now we're taking a small pause, but we will continue to grow. Converge is a software enabled IT and cloud solutions provider with established solutions providing providing solutions around the world. Uh, we have expertise in management, consulting services, managed services, and cloud solutions. Converge Global Solution delivers advanced analytics, application modernization, cloud platforms, cybersecurity, digital infrastructure, and digital workplace offerings to clients around various industries. The company supports these solutions with advisory implementation and managed services expertise across all major IT vendors in the marketplace. This multifaceted approach enables Converge to address the unique business and technology requirements of all clients in the public and private sector. I like to call us the one-stop shop. There's nothing that within our company because we have specialists in everything that we can't do. So as you can see, we're now starting with taking over the mind frame business and uh, we plan to explore that and expand that in 2023. And uh, we're looking to continue our offerings. And that's what I got to say. That's very good, Denzel. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you spending time with us. And I, I know you're very busy running our office also in uh, Manhattan, which uh, keeps you on your toes. As I find every time I call you, I'm always bothering you. <laughs> But, that, Never. but that's my that's my job. I always tell that to my wife. It's my job to bother everybody. <laughs> but thank you for everything you do and uh, for giving us this nice summary. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, uh, next couple of slides, I'm going to say a few words before I turn it over to Salisu. Um, you know, because of how important it is in and around the mainframe with performance and capacity planning, we place a lot of value on it. And we have uh, built uh, very nice tooling and very nice way methodologies to help our clients and now also making it available through some open source tooling. And, um, you know, uh, as I mentioned, being part of the way of making it more globally available to the rest of the world, uh, we have invested in making it our tooling and things that you're about to hear from Salisu available uh, into open source. And uh, the world of open source really, pardon the pun, opens the, the world to uh, the mainframe environment that uh, normally would have been uh, kept separate. So I'm going to now uh, turn it over to our friend Salisu. Salisu uh, met with Alex Kim on our team, uh, working on the Zebra project and also, uh, through, uh, a couple, now a, a couple of internships. I even believe Salisu, you even have your brother getting involved now too, right? That's, that's very, very nice. So let me turn it over to you. Uh, and so nice to hear and see you. It's been too long. But uh, hopefully things are getting better with uh, COVID finally uh, disappearing little by little here. So let me turn it over to you, Sal. So tell me when you want me to uh, change your slides. Say next slide and I'll go to it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Len. Just like uh, Len has mentioned, uh, my name is Sal Ali, and I'm a student, an undergraduate student here in Nigeria. So I started working on Zebra as an intern back in 2020 together with my mentor, as you can see here, Alice Kim. Uh, started the project in 2020 as part of the Open Mainframe Project Internship. So we started with the goal of just creating a simple, a simple program that will just create a standard JSON format for RMF data. So towards the end of the mentorship, the program was uh, the project was adopted by Zoe as an incubator project in 2021. So next slide, please. Um, the name Zebra is not the official name of the project. It's just like 
an abbreviation of the full name. The full name of the project is Zoe Embedded Browser for RMF and APIs. So Zebra is an open source incubator for open mainframe projects under Zoe. Just like I mentioned, it was adopted in 2021. So the main goal of this project is to provide a reusable and industry compliant RMF data in JSON format. So the benefit of using JSON is that it is a modern standard that is very attractive to developers. And there are a lot of open source tools that consume JSON. So that's why we decide to go with the JSON format. And one of the tools we are using for our visualization is Grafana to harvest zebra metrics. Next slide, please. So this is the basic architecture we have we use for Zebra. So it is like a very simple architecture that starts with the user's request. So whenever a user send a request to Zebra, the engine will now process this request and send and send for a data to be processed by RMSDBM. The data will be returned back to Zebra, which will then be processed using one of the three Zebra passes. Initially, we had three passes, but now we have which is the RMF post processor and RMF processor three. From there, this data is now converted from XML to JSON format. The JSON data can be returned to the user as a response through the Zoe API catalog or the browser. The same JSON data can be converted into Prometheus metrics using a Prometheus client and saved to Prometheus server. The data in Prometheus server can then be used to plot Grafana charts. Next slide, please. So you can visit the live demo site for Zebra at https zebra.talktothemainframe.com for 3390. And this is easy to use. Next slide. So Zebra features the RML post processor. Next slide, please. So for RML post processor, in this case, we'll be discussing the workload management group report. So for Zebra, we have what we call the API version. Currently, we're using version one. So as you can see on the URL, we have to specify it through V1. V1 stands for Zebra API version one. After that, the user will need to specify the helper. This helper has to be configured within the Zebra configuration file. In this case, we have configured our helper as RPRT. So we have specified the name of the helper. And then the user also need to specify the name, the type of the report. In this case, we are trying to request a post processor report, which is represented by the RMF PP. And then the user will also need to specify the name of the report. In this case, we are trying to request workload management group report. As you can see on the left hand side is the example of the JSON that will be returned to the user after all this has been processed by Zebra. Next slide, please. So interpreting the, <coughs> sorry, interpreting the data for post processor. As we can see on the left hand side, there are a lot of data that has been returned to the user. Some of them are represented by objects. For example, on the left hand side, it has been explained here. We are trying to look at the data for STC high workload class. And we're also looking at another one for the service class, STC high, which are all represented on this chart. The period is one. And then we have the performance index of 1.1. We have execution velocity goal of 50%. And then we have execution velocity actual of 45.8%. Next slide, please. So this is, we are going to discuss the use cases. And one of the use cases for Zebra is BPAD, which is which was developed by Belcom Infinity. Next slide, please. So BFAT stands for, stands for Vicom Performance Analysis Tool. The main aim of this uh, tool is to analyze utilization on LPA level, break down utilization on a workload level, diagnose poor performance with AI, plan capacity and model future processors, keep track of long-term utilization to find trends, and then the new feature that was added is to integrate with Zebra to pull RMF data. Next slide, please. 
So using Zebra as a data source for BPI. Before Zebra, the RMF reports for CPU and workload had to be run manually and exported to a Windows machine. But now, just using BPI instance, you can collect this data from Zebra. You can pull the JSON data using Zebra to do the needed analysis with BPAD. Next slide, please. So BPAD can analyze utilization by helper and processor type. This is an example as comparing the general central processor usage between helper A through helper F. Next slide, please. BFAT can also show the MIFs consumed by an alpha, which is depicted on this chart. Next slide, please. So additionally, BFAT can break down utilization by workload. As you can see on this chart, we are comparing the usage between workload in alpha A. Next slide, please. Along with utilization, you can analyze delays within workload. On this chart, it's an example of total delay of the DDF2 service class period two in LPA A. Next slide, please. BFAT uses artificial intelligence on, on the metrics to determine performance quality as well. This is an AI, AI functionality of BFAT. Next slide, please. So selecting an interval of time will provide further analysis and recommendations to improve performance, just like it is shown in the picture. Next slide, please. So now we'll be talking about RMF Monitor 3, which is the near real-time data reporting. Next slide, please. So just like we did with the post processor, we can also use Zebra version one API to request RMF monitor three data. In this case, we also need to specify the LPI name, just like we did before. Our LPI name is RPRT, which has been configured in our Zebra configuration file. Then in this case, we are no more using RMF PP, which stands for post processor. Rather, we are using RMF three. This is the type of the report we are trying to access, which is from monitor three. And then the name of the report we are trying to access is the CPC report. And then on this image, you can see a sample JSON of the CPC report, which has been returned by Zebra. Next slide, please. So interpreting the data, just like we did with the post processor, we can also interpret the data for monitor three. In this case, what we have is the partition name we are looking at is the QCK2. Then we have the average number of logical processors, which is two. We have processor types, which is the CP. We have logical processor total utilization 0 0.3. The physical processor total utilization, which is also 0.3%. Then partition weight of 25%. Next slide, please. So common use cases, which is visualization with Grafana. Next slide, please. As I have mentioned earlier, we use Grafana to create amazing charts using data pulled by Zebra. So this is just an example by one of from the from the Zebra community by Fernando Zingari, who is a senior IT consultant in Argentina. So he was able to provide us with this amazing chart from Grafana, which he used to create a usage data from RMF monitor three, which is a real time data. Next slide, please. This is also a continuation of the charts. In this case, he's trying to pull data from CPC report, as we can see delay for processors. There's also the MSU per partition. Next slide, please. So another Zeb another use case for Zebra is the Viva, the Viacom Infinity Voice Assistant. This is also another invention from Viacom Infinity. Next slide, please. So 
The question here is, do you trust Alexa and Google Home for enterprise data? There is no telling where the data is going. Next slide, please. But with Viacom Infinity Voice Assistant Viva, you can be rest assured that your enterprise data is highly secured because Viber provides a secure and enterprise-ready voice assistant, which gives you freedom of processing your business conversation securely on-premises based voice user interface. For example, you can just say, hey, TJ, what's the current CPU utilization? If you are not interested in the CPU utilization, you might like to ask something else like, hey, TJ, how is the outlook for my mainframe software bill for this month? You can as well ask other questions like the snapshot for your CPU report for this week, the software model of the current machine, what is the MCL version and Z system, if they are the same, then how long did my bad job run today? Next slide, please. So the problem with other voice user interface, so voice user interface give you freedom of not touching keyboard for action, but current consumer solutions only provide an option for storing your conversations through voice data on a public cloud. But with Viva, it was developed with maximum security in mind. Viacom Infinity Voice Assistants will store your conversation on premise using IBM Watson Linux One Secure Service Container with Zoe as easy and secure API gateway for your enterprise application. Next slide, please. So how Viber utilizes Zebra for performance metrics? This is just a simple example of a user saying, hey TJ, what's the current utilization of the BIRP T alpha? So Viber will now determine the intent from the user's words. And then using a secure Viber NLP server, it will request for CPC report. A Zebra instance will process this and return a past JSON report. So Viber will now extract the utilization for LPA BIRPT. Then the user will get a response like the current utilization is 83.2%. Next slide, next slide, please. So how Viber utilizes Zebra for performance metrics? These are a set of questions you can ask Viber and you get a response. For example, hey TJ, what processor are we using? And you can get a response like this system has an 8562Z02 processor. Hey TJ, what LPA in our system use central processors? The LPAs that use CPs are TRNG, QCK2, and BIRPT. So, hey TJ, what is the current CPU utilization of the BIRPT LPA? The current utilization is 83.2%. Next slide, please. So Zebra, a powerful tool. Zebra is a perfect tool for RMF performance metrics more than a modernization. We only showcase a few use cases. The possibilities are endless. So if you are interested in joining the project, please reach out or check out the Zoe calendar. We meet bi-weekly on Thursdays at 8 a.m. EST through Zoom. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Salasu. And uh, we made it. All the way from Lagos, huh? With yes. the internet connect. Thank goodness the internet connection held up. So yeah. thank you so much, Sal. So we really appreciate all your time. Let's move on to the next section. And that will be from uh, John Wolfgang, who we all call JW. Uh, JW, maybe we can uh, start off with uh, your piece here. Okay, thank you, Len. Um, okay, so Salasu talked about um, using data from RMF, um, and so beyond RMF, you can also get similar data from storage systems through their API. You know, for instance, you could ask Viva, uh, hey, TJ, what's my current storage utilization? So that's what I'm going to talk about um, generally for a few minutes. So I want to start off just by talking about the uh, IBM storage portfolio and kind of giving a little context. So this is the... This chart shows the complete uh, storage portfolio. If you start over with me on the right, um, there's data, I mean, there's systems, uh, software-defined systems, as well as hardware systems for AI, unstructured data. 
um, container systems uh, in the middle there, spectrum fusion, and then on the left is um, the primary storage. So what you would here refer to as block storage. So um, software defined storage, spectrum virtualized, but also hardware systems, SVC and flash systems for open systems software. And then in the middle, if you could click the mouse, the, um, the storage for enterprise servers is uh, the DS8900 family and the TS7700 family. So that's the, the TS7700 is virtual storage, um, sorry, virtual tape, disk under the covers, but virtual tape. And where I'm gonna spend the rest of my talk is focusing on the DS8900 family. So this is the, the um, mainframe attached. It does open systems, fixed block storage, but also mainframe storage. So next slide, please. This is the DS8900. As you can see, it's an all flash uh, storage portfolio. So no more spinning disk inside here. Uh, I'll start at the right again. So this over on the right, you can see this is the high end, kind of the flagship, the 8980 model. Um, but the three you see pictured here, the 8910, 8950, and 8980 over on the right are your traditional big rack comes in, everything's built and installed as is um, one piece you can see the the right two can be expanded to a second frame the main difference between those is the the performance the capacity you know obviously two frames you can install more flash drives you can install more uh, host adapter cards etc um, but they also the bigger ones on the right will have more powerful processors larger cache etc now, all the way to the left then is um, really interesting in, in my opinion. So now you also, IBM also provides rackless solutions of the 8910. So on the left, you can see that there's space allocated, physical space allocated inside the Z, starting with the Z15 and newer Linux, Linux one and newer versions where the storage system, a, um, 48 flash drive configuration of the DS8910 can actually disappear into your um, Z footprint. So as far as footprint, as far as power, the storage is, is inside and integrated. You don't need any separate space. You can also have a rackless um, configuration of the ES, DS8910, which you put into your own data center rack. And that is um, very useful for smaller systems and uh, you can even expand that from 48 to 96 flash drives. So across the entire portfolio, it's, as you can see at the bottom, you know, it's the same microcode stack. So it's the same software features, the same advanced capabilities. And if you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll spend another minute talking about that. So over on the right, you see the, the characteristics, the, the design goals, if you will, for the 8900 family. So ultra low latency, um, and that's accomplished beyond FICON for Z. Um, there's a Z hyperlink, which is a, a hardware capability. So it's a, a new physical link between the, the Z16, for instance, and the DS8910 to provide sub 20 microsecond response time for eligible workloads. Uh, maximum availability, of course, system recovery, cyber resiliency through um, all the DSAKs that I showed you previously have the capability for safeguarded copy, which is um, a point in time cyber resiliency, like locked away, air gapped uh, potential solution to save up to 500, you know, copies. You're just taking a copy of, of your, your data every whatever, two hours, one hour, once a day, whatever, you know, you can craft it to whatever you like and saving that off. So if you ever have some sort of cyber attack or a logical corruption, you can actually, you can essentially go back in time, bring back that, that data from, from when it was valid. And very advanced replication capabilities. Beyond that, it also provides the capability for hundred percent data encryption with both data at rest, well, with all data at rest encryption, pervasive encryption, and even fiber channel endpoint security, which 
you can configure the box in conjunction with a Z16 to do encryption while the data is flowing across the FICON links, for instance. I had mentioned the seven, TS7700 before. Um, the, there's a big functionality of the DS8900 called transparent cloud tiering, which allows you to um, offload data directly to an object store. And the TS7700 can act as that. So you could have like an on-site um, object store and have the ability to offload that DS8900 data very securely um, within your data center. Or you could offload it to, to various um, public clouds. So that's just kind of a highlight of, again, this is throughout the entire 8900 um, storage family. So you go to the next slide. Now, what I mentioned earlier, and what we're really focusing on here is the API. So um, the DS8900, as well as the other um, pieces in the, in the storage family, it does have a RESTful API. And so you could instrument to this RESTful API to get data um, very similar to what was shown previous by, previously by Salasu for, um, for Viva, for Grafana, whatever you want. Um, and I'm just going to take you through a couple charts showing, you know, how to use the RESTful API. So it does support create, read, update, delete operations, as you can see through the, the various mappings of post, get, put, and delete HTTP operations. Um, and just in generally, you can operate or query a single resource, like a volume or, a, or one particular host, one particular pool, or a list of resources, like all the pools on a specific system. Um, so go to the next chart and I'll kind of um, get into um, the first step is authentication to the API. So um, instead of passing back and forth username and password, like on every command, the way that the DS8K specifically works is you, you, you post an authentication token with your authentication information. And, and this token that is then returned, you use for all your subsequent operations. And that's the way that um, you kind of get started with the API, the, the security methods. There's um, it does, the token op expires after a while for security, so it's not forever. But that's kind of the basic idea. So you're going to once upload your your authentication info, you're going to get this token, and then you're going to use this secure token in your subsequent operations. So next slide, please. So here's just an example of um, a query. So I mentioned you can do queries and you can do update operations. So um, you're going to append the V1 systems query. That's a specific query. And this shows you the JSON of what you're going to get back in response. So, um, you know, you, you can just see the, the information that's there um, from the name and the state and the, the microcode bundle, et cetera. So um, pretty straightforward. There's a bunch of different um, queries that you can issue. You know, this is the systems query, the entire kind of like overall system. So, you know, imagine asking Viva what your overall um, capacity available is, you know, and, and Viva would issue this API query, pull it out, tell you that your capacity available is, you know, 30 terabytes of storage in, in this spe specific example out of 105.8 total. Um, you can also issue queries to determine, get information on your IO enclosures, ports, flash arrays, um, your logical configuration information. So tell me about my logical control units or my volumes in, in my pools. Um, I, I can get lists of events, lists of users, performance data, um, which is, you know, very valid, uh, very relevant to what we're talking about here. So you can actually, you could actually use Viva to pull out perform specific performance info in what's going on on your box. You can also view um, support information like ODD dumps, PE packages, state saves that are available um, to be offloaded to IBM support. And copy services, you can view flash copies, you can you view remote mirror paths and pairs for all the different flavors, Metro mirror, global mirror, global copy, et cetera. Um, so a lot of um, functionality, a lot of capability there for querying various parts of the DS8900. 
Next slide, please. And then here, I just wanted to um, do one more example, and this is a request example. So this is, um, instead of just querying, now we're talking about actually affecting the system. So we're going to post the V1 volumes in order to create a new volume. And this shows you the request, the, the parameters that you need to give it, um, some examples. Um, and you can read through that and see. So basically what you're telling it is, the important part is what type of storage, whether you want, C, you want CKD, what pool you want it to come out at, and what your capacity is going to be, and what LSS it's, it's inside of. Um, the others are, are optional. So, and then you issue this uh, API call, this API post, um, and it'll return you, you know, there's an example response down below showing you status was okay, it completed successfully. Obviously, if it was not unable to complete, you get a different um, status and a different response. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of different requests, and I'm not going to go through any other examples of that. But, you know, for most of the um, components that I just mentioned, you, you, the queries are available for you can create, update, and delete them, like, you know, create volumes as an obviously create logical control units, create uh, ODD PE packages and state saves and to be offloaded to IBM support, for instance. There's even more advanced remote mirror management, um, like for the flash copies and especially for the remote mirrors, um, beyond just the create, update, and delete, which is what you typically get, you can also issue commands like pause, resume, freeze, unfreeze. So it gives you the full functionality to instrument your um, data replication environment if you are looking to instrument DR tests or or um, data site swaps, et cetera, stuff like that. You know, you have more capability. So that is um, what I wanted to cover today related to the, the RESTful API for the storage family. So next slide. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. John, it was fantastic. Um, if anybody that's viewing this uh, has any questions for us, uh, since you were not able to be here with us live, if you have our contact information, uh, we can help arrange any kinds of proof of technologies and or proof of concepts, my email, my cell phone number, and a little, a little summary of our company again. But I think uh, that pretty much does it for today. Uh, does team, are there any other closing remarks you would, we would like to make before we uh, close the session? Anybody? No. All right. Then um, we'll end the session and uh, we look forward to anybody that has any questions to reach out uh, when and if you have them. Thank you very much.